Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to many of you. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm Maggie Mahan, the Assistant Director for Advancement and Engagement with the State Historical Society of Missouri. Thank you so much for joining us today as the director of our Cape Girardeau Research Center, Bill Edelman, explores using tax lists in genealogy research. If you need to catch up on previous installments of Bill's genealogy series, today is the 14th episode, or if you would like to rewatch any of the segments, you can view them on demand on the State Historical Society of Missouri's website at shsmo.org. All events in our virtual programming series are made possible thanks to the generous support of the Society's members and donors. You can visit our website to learn more and see how you can add or renew your support. A few notes as we get started today. There is a corresponding handout to today's presentation. I will be putting that link into the chat just now, and we'll share it again once I turn things over to Bill. Meanwhile, we welcome your questions for Bill and have reserved some time at the end of his presentation for Q&A. Thank you again for joining us. And now I will turn it over to Bill. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, it's good to be back and uh, talking about a topic that this one and the last one really are like, uh, I, I guess, level two genealogy topics, uh, the first 12 being the basics. So uh, today we're going to talk about tax lists, something that a lot of people don't use, but they probably should if they can access them. Well, everybody loves taxes, right? Nobody loves taxes. They don't like to have to pay taxes, but it depends on what you get back. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, Supreme Court Justice and Civil War veteran, one of the things he said is taxes are what we pay for civilized society. Uh, I guess the counter to that is Ben Franklin's quote about uh, nothing is certain but death and taxes. Now, what we're not going to talk about is the taxes that usually jump to mind when people talk about taxes is income tax. Income tax is something that came along relatively late. Um, the records are not really accessible for you to use for genealogy. We're going to be talking about taxes that are uh, much older than the income tax predominantly. So some of the things we're gonna to cover today are why are tax records valuable for genealogy? What information are you going to find? How are they organized? Where do you find them? How do you find them? And what about Missouri lists? Uh, as, as I usually do, I'm gonna orient this somewhat heavily toward Missouri. What's a good strategy for finding what I need? And what are some tips for using tax lists? A tax list is an assessment. It's not really the taxes. It uh, may have notations about whether the tax was paid or not, but it's really just a list of who was assessed for property ownership and value uh, of the property. And the estimated tax is usually in a list as well, although not always. Uh, it's a listing to provide guidance for the next year's assessment. You'll see some and you'll you'll wonder, well, why do they have these two copies? Well, you'll look closely and one copy is really oriented toward whoever does the tax assessment next year will have a list to base their next year's taxes on. So usually that would have been the sheriff in Missouri early. Uh, there wasn't a separate assessor but uh, the, the sheriff would oftentimes deputize people to help, but uh, they needed somewhere to start. And so they'd save last year's list and use that to start next year's list. The major types of taxes, and you'll find these sometimes in separate lists and sometimes combined. Real estate, that is land, lots, uh, houses on the lots sometimes. Personal property, which varied all over the map. And then oftentimes a poll tax, which is a per head tax. You'll oftentimes see these in a tax list in early Missouri merged together. They're all in one list. There'll be different columns that cover those things. 
And then sometimes there might have been taxes on income. The first income tax in the U.S. really didn't come along until, uh, well, there was one in 1798, a direct tax. Very few records have survived. But then the Civil War necessitated funding the war, and so an income tax was implemented at that time. Why are they valuable? They can tell you your ancestor was at a given location at a given time. And if they're, if they're done so that there's maximum information in them, you might even get a more specific location other than just the county or your ancestor. They predate censuses. So you can uh, determine if your ancestor was in a given location even before 1790 in some cases. They fill gaps between census years. Uh, the best case is you have every tax list for every year in a given 10-year uh, period. Unfortunately, that rarely happens in many areas. Um, they're the source for census reconstruction. So you'll see a lot of places where people have gone to the trouble to look at the tax list for 1890 to reconstruct the 1890 census. Of course, it would just be an equivalent of head of household or whoever owned property, but uh, it's better than nothing. As an example, Cape Girardeau County, my home county, the first surviving uh, federal census after 1803, there was an 1803 census that was taken at the time of the Louisiana Purchase, it was 1830. Before that, they were lost. We just have recapitulations with totals. There are tax lists for Cape Girardeau County in territorial days in 1814, 1815, 17, 18, 19, and 20. You'll notice there's a gap there. It's been lost. And then there's 1822, 1828, and 1829. And then to figure out how to get, get that gone. Um, and then they've reconstructed the 1890 census in Cape Girardeau County with tax lists. Why are they valuable? Well, you can actually get an idea of the age of some individuals from tax lists because men were not taxed until they were 21 in most jurisdictions. In some cases, early on, 16 was the first age at which men were taxed, uh, particularly the earlier you go. So in this case, this individual, Austin Fulbright, on the Cape Girardeau County 1835 tax list, was taxed as a poll, which meant a per head tax. He also died in 1835. So this is one of the few records other than a tombstone we have for Austin Fulbright. You can sometimes identify multiple generations in a household that were not identified in censuses until 1850. So if you have uh, an individual mentioned that has a bunch of property, real, real property, personal property, and then there are individuals below them in the tax list that have the same surname and are only identified as polls it's probably sons of the guy with all the property. Although you can't say that for sure, you can get an idea and maybe look for those individuals and find more relationship information. You can also identify men with the same name in the same county. That might not be possible with many other records. You may just find a John Smith and assume it's the same guy. But if there's two of them in a tax list or three or four, uh, gosh, we've got to account for the fact that there's multiple people with the same name. Some of the tax lists, you'll see this, Moses Bullinger, son of Daniel. Wow. You actually got the relationship identified in that case. Sometimes you can identify widows. Oftentimes what would happen is the father owned property he died, he was in the tax list. The next year he's gone, but the same property or the same acreage is listed under a woman's name. That is more than likely his widow. And then the next year it's listed with somebody else and you can't find a deed. Well, 
Sometimes you can identify that there was a remarriage through that. Men were rarely missed. Somehow those sheriffs managed to find people, uh, I guess better than the IRS even, and they were taxed, uh, uh, even if they didn't own property, as a poll. Helps to identify and narrow down death years. Again, if somebody's shown owning property and the next year it's taxed to either their administrator or their widow or someone else, it indicates they probably died. Economic circumstances. If someone is identified repeatedly with no real property, they were probably a poor economic status. And then others might have tons of property, which indicates they're quite well off. To some extent, you can um, either get relationships or infer relationships. And you can also look at movements. You might have someone taxed in one place and the next year they're taxed in a different location in another state. Different uh, jurisdictions assess taxes. And again, the federal government, there was a 1798 direct tax. There are a few Eastern states for which that survived, but not many. And the uh, records are, I believe, in the National Archives. From 1862 to 1872, there was an income tax to pay for the Civil War. And I've looked at those records. You can find those on Ancestry, those assessments. And uh, you really had to own a lot to be taxed in that tax. Normal, regular farmers were not often taxed. So it was a pretty high-end tax in terms of uh, assessment. And then in 1912, to date, we have the income tax. States also, of course, could assess taxes. You had in New England, the functional unit is the town rather than the county. So you had town taxes. Counties in our part of the world in Missouri, uh, and sometimes by militia district or administrative township. I know when I do research in North Carolina, you don't find county lists. You find county or well, you find Captain Burger's district within this county. Uh, so as a result, you get kind of a patchwork of surviving lists. And then sometimes local entities taxed. Early, this is pretty rare. Uh, nowadays, of course, we have local taxes, town taxes, city taxes, and so forth. But early on, that's relatively rare. Be aware of county boundary changes. This is just like land records or census. You have to keep in mind that your ancestor may not have moved, the county boundary may have moved. And so someone may have been taxed in one county in one year, and then in the next county or another county in the following year. And what happened was they either created a new county or they moved the county boundaries. They didn't move. So you really have to be aware of those county boundary changes. Who was taxed? Well, typically free white men, age 16 or 21 and up, and usually by state law, there was an upper limit on the age of individuals that were taxed. Not always, but this is pretty typical. And it's typically age 55 or 60. It may be 65. It may change from year to year. You have to pay attention to the law for that year. Free persons of color were taxed right along with free white men. Any owner of real estate or personal property in some cases was taxed. Owners of stocks and bonds, sometimes, I know there were certain periods early in Missouri where they did tax that. Uh, it was probably a little bit tougher to chase down. And then administrators of estates or executors of wills for some individuals. One thing to keep in mind is you will encounter, because this is a process that is under a state law, typically, um, you will find terminology that is legal terminology. There's 
variety of places you can go to look at that. At the very least, you can Google a lot of legal terms, but the ultimate source is the law dictionary. And a favorite one is Black's Law Dictionary. A lot of the archaic terms that might have been in use in the 1800s survived through the fourth edition of Black's. After that, they eliminated a lot of obsolete terms. So it's a good idea if you can access the fourth edition of Black's and you can find it online if you search. This is like trying to chase the sun because I used to know where to go access the whole thing uh, and look at the whole thing. Now you have to find a site and download it in PDF format because that site went away. And so if you can download it in PDF format, it's a massive document, but has all the definitions in it. It's less expensive if you want to get a hard copy to find a used one. It can be horrifically expensive if you don't find a cheap one. So beware. A few definitions that you would find in Blacks or another law dictionary that are handy. First of all, in the title of my talk, I talk about neat cattle. It's really just a kind of an all-encompassing obsolete term for cattle when you get right down to it. Uh, Blacks defines it as oxen or heifers. Uh, leaves out bulls for some reason. I've seen some definitions that include bulls. But it's the source, if you've ever heard of Neat's foot oil. This was originally a product of uh, butchering cattle and rendering the, the fat and making an oil out of it to treat leather. So uh, we still use it for leather. A pole is each person in a given jurisdiction with, within some defined class. So either white males over 21 or 16 or black males, uh, free people of color, uh, anybody, another uh, synonym for that is tithable. So many tithables, and you'll see that used in some jurisdictions rather than poll. Confirmed acres in Missouri and some of the other states of the Louisiana Purchase, they had to confirm your Spanish or French land grant, and so they sometimes didn't tax land until it was confirmed or they taxed it at a lower rate if it was unconfirmed. Um, once it was confirmed, it, be, it became whatever rate confirmed land was. And so you, you run into that and you'll think, what does that mean? That's what it means. There was an annual process that taxation went through. The first step was the legislative body or designate determines taxable items and rates. A few examples of taxable items, at least in Missouri, many states had poles, slaves, horses and mules, cattle, some tax dwellings in certain years, distilleries, and a lot of people, when you used to have a still, you know, if you had a license, it was perfectly legal, but they were going to tax it. Um, uh, Mills were taxed in many years, pleasure carriages. This was mostly rich people, money at interest, land, town lots, and so forth. These are all examples. Um, you find Missouri legislation for different years or different ranges of years at several sites, the state archives, uh, Google Books, uh, Hattie Trust, internet archives, some of them are there, but you have to find the law for the year that you're looking at the tax list for, because otherwise you're not going to be able to totally explain that tax list. Secondly, the information is published or communicated to local officials, such as the sheriff, the assessor, the collector, or whoever did the tax assessment and collecting, typically the sheriff early on. Local officials then determine how to assess individuals or assess individuals. And so here's an ad I've got from a local newspaper, uh, again, Cape Girardeau County. And the way they did it there is the collector for that year in 1821, in this case, 
said he would be at the courthouse on certain days. He would be at certain well-known established houses certain days and move around the county to different townships and be at a certain house at a certain day. And so the first stab at this, the honest people would come in and say, I've got this much land, this, this many cattle, so many slaves over 10 years old or whatever. And, uh, they'd report it. And then after that, it's when they started to send the sheriff and deputies out to find the holdouts. Next, the list was compiled and taxpayers were notified. Um, here's how much you owe. They also made out a preliminary list of next year's taxables and uh, I believe they had to send uh, one copy to the state and retain a copy locally. And then oftentimes the, the third copy would be next year's preliminary list. Taxpayers were notified. Um, the payment was received. And a receipt given to the individual. A lot of times you'll find those receipts in probate files, by the way, or in family papers. If somebody didn't pay, they would determine delinquents and they would publish a notice of delinquency in the uh, whatever newspaper was closest. Assessment lists were organized in different ways. The more typical one, unfortunately, and you'll find out why I'm saying that here in a minute, was alphabetical. Just alphabetical by surname. And of course, early on, alphabetical meant all the A's, no matter what the second letter in the surname was in one list, all the B's and all the C's and so forth. You've got to be aware of errors. Sometimes they would get confused if somebody had an unusual name or if they were not paying attention and they'd list the person's given name first and put them in the wrong section. So there was a guy in North Carolina who was a big landowner who was wait still Avery. Sometimes he's under W's in tax lists, even though his last name was Avery. And then also you have misinterpretations of spelling. So you might find your Kaufman with a K ancestor in the C's under Kaufman with a C. The whole county might have been alphabetized or they might have alphabetized by administrative townships or militia districts. They might keep a separate list for single men. I've not seen that in Missouri, although it may have existed. Uh, and then they have a separate non-resident list. If people own property, particularly land, they were going to be assessed for it and have to pay tax, even if they lived two states away. What are you going to find in these lists? Oh, and by the way, the reason you like order of visit, which is a rarity, but a very valuable rarity in tax lists, is that tells you who lived next door to each other. And so you can trace the route of the tax uh, collector and you know where people live rather than just in an administrative township. So you're going to get the taxpayer's name in the tax list which sometimes may not be the person that actually owned the, the land. Uh, a good example of that is if somebody had died, their administrator might be assessed for the tax. And so they, it would be under their name in the tax list. The original claimant and or patentee might be in the tax list, which allows you to follow a chain of title very nicely and determine, okay, this, John Smith owned land that was originally claimed by Sam Jones to distinguish him from the John Smith that had land originally claimed by William Jones. So that's handy. The water course, that is the stream on which the land is located, the drainage. The land area, either in acreage or early on arpens or arpents. Dwelling houses, if that was assessed. Improvements, an improvement is anything like a building, an outbuilding, uh, a cleared field, a fence, anything that improved the property value. 
section, part of section or survey number, according to the uh, U.S. public land system. Uh, survey number, if it was a confirmed Spanish or French land grant. Land and real property valuation. And town lots, uh, if it was in town, um, any other oddball pieces of uh, real property. Then you would have slaves uh, prior to, in Missouri, at least what I found, 1864 is when they stopped assessing slaves. Um, and usually they would set a minimum age, sometimes three years, sometimes 10 years to uh, tax the slave. Horses, they would set a minimum age for horses, usually three years for horses in Missouri early on and mules two years in their valuation. Neat cattle over three years old in their valuation. Mills, distilleries, and tanyards. Um, I always get a kick out of this one. Watches, appendages, and clocks. For some reason, it was felt that uh, timepieces were some sort of luxury item, I think. Pleasure carriages, free white males, and for one year, Missouri had a bachelor's tax, which was incredibly unpopular. It, uh, they assessed an extra charge on bachelors. And the idea was we need these guys who are out here on the frontier to find a, a potential wife and get married because we need, you know, families working land. Well, it didn't work very well. It mostly just succeeded in making people mad. And then the amount of the tax. Sometimes, uh, depending on the year and the tax list and the location, money gaining interest, stocks and bonds. Sometimes it would even list occupation and number of employees for a business. So there's a link for North Carolina to explain what was in their tax list uh, for a given, for early on at least. So what do we get uh, in terms of an ancestor and tracing that ancestor through time? We really would love to have this from tax lists. Nice, complete set of tax lists over time from the time our ancestor turned 21 till the time they got too old to assess their property. Wonderful. And you get this in places like Virginia, where the lists have survived. Instead, and in, for many Missouri counties, we get this, gaps. And I've actually seen some Missouri counties where you could pretty much throw away all but about one or two of those puzzle pieces uh, in, in early days. Uh, but we got we to gotta do, make do with what we've got. And sometimes it'll work and sometimes it doesn't work nearly as well. I'll give you an example of a tax list. This is the 1831 Cape Girardeau County tax list. It's an original tax list in the County Archives Center. And you can tell they did not go to a lot of trouble to find high rag content, really high quality paper to make these lists. They were never intended to last 200 years. So uh, they're not great quality paper usually. So we gotta, again, make do with what we've got. And you can see there's pieces of this that are gone but you're going to find the first page, which has all the column headings. And in this case, a guy named Ebenezer Flynn was the assessor. And they're alphabetical. And you can see the person that was taxed in the far left, then the original owner of the property, and so forth. And then we go through the section of it uh, on the right-hand side of the page. These are huge folio size pages. And you can see all the personal property lists. Some of these have been transcribed and you can always tell when it's gonna be valuable because they transcribe the entire list. This is Greene County where Springfield is for 1835. And they have transcribed the entire list. Love it, good stuff. Unfortunately, it's alphabetized, but that's pretty typical. 
then at the very end of the list, they will have a recapitulation where they will list the things that were in the column headings and how much tax is coming in from each of those items for the whole county. How do you use tax list? How do you use them? Well, I said that was a good example for Greene County of how you do a tax list if you're going to transcribe it because it's the whole list. This is an example of how not to transcribe a tax list. It's actually from the days when the name was considered the only important thing in the tax list. But we now know you can find so much more out if you've got the whole thing. So this is a tax list from 1814 and all it lists is the names. Okay, that tells me that that person was there in 1814 and that's really about it. Although there's a few little details like um, senior and junior, which may or may not be um, father and son, uh, somebody's administrator, uh, there might be son of later on, but as a whole, I can get far more out of the original 1814 list, which is digitized and available uh, out there. Okay, so when you wanna use a tax list, the first thing I do is know the law for the year of interest. It's gonna explain what's in the list. Then, are we dealing with a primary record or a derivative record? Sometimes that's tough to tell uh, because you don't know if it's the original, all of it's to a certain extent copied because you know they didn't carry the big folio out in the field with them. But uh, some of those copies were copies of copies. This is definitely a derivative record when you look at this transcription here. But any, anyhow, don't just copy the name, copy or abstract everything in the list because you may need it. Note the page number, the township, uh, and the amount of the tax. Some of these aren't paginated. I've actually superimposed page numbers on some of the Cape County lists, which you would put in brackets um, just to give people a roadmap where to go if they ever look at the original or the digitized version of it. Check all years available in the time frame of interest. Make sure that there's a gap, really, and not just a list that might be elsewhere. Always use tax lists in connection with other records. That is going to increase their value. Check related surnames because they may have misspelled somebody or the brother-in-law might be nearby or the father of the wife might be nearby. So check all related surnames. Where do you find them? Sometimes in county courthouses or county archives, not always were they saved though. I think in many cases they were either lost in courthouse fires or discarded. State and local archives, the state archives, if we're talking about past mid 1800s, the Missouri State Archives has a marvelous collection of microfilm tax records. And many of them before that, if they exist. It's uh, really when you hit about Civil War era that uh, tax lists started to be saved or were still available when microfilm came along. So you get a more complete picture. You can look online by Googling the county name and state and then just tax list in a year. And sometimes that'll pop up. Uh, you might be better off doing that in Ancestry. They may be in deed books. Early tax lists were sometimes in the back of deed books, depending on where you're talking about. Libraries, well, the Library of Virginia is really a state archives but it has the title of Library of Virginia, but there are st some state libraries and other libraries that may have local tax lists. Find transcriptions, but be cautious. These, I'd say of everything has been transcribed for genealogy, I, I would venture to say there's probably more errors in tax list transcriptions than just about anything. And then historical societies may have ended up with them. Many of the earliest tax lists in Missouri 
uh, the originals are actually in the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis. But as we'll see, you don't need to go there now yet. Where do I find tax lists again going on? Ancestry has a number. Um, if you want to search for them, you would click search and then card catalog and use tax list and then the state you're interested in for a search. Read the information about the database, always important, and then click on the appropriate listing by name and most of them would be searchable. Family search has a wiki and a cat and the catalog option for many tax lists. For Missouri, county courthouses oftentimes have them unless there was a catastrophic courthouse fire or they were sent to the state archives or elsewhere. I think many counties did send them to the Missouri Historical Society, their earlier lists. Uh, the state archives, again, probably about the best one-stop shop for uh, tax lists in Missouri. And then there are territorial tax lists, which are, again, they're in the state archives, but I'll show you where you can access those even more easily here in a minute. The Missouri Digital Heritage, and I'll more about that momentarily. The State Historical Society of Missouri, uh, usually in Columbia, but some out in the research centers away from Columbia, but mostly in Columbia, may have some. Local historical societies may have some. I was in one county in Missouri where their tax lists for the 1800s were held by the local historical society because the courthouse ran out of room. And so I had to go there when I was researching in that county. Uh, that's just a loan situation, though. They are still owned by the county or overseen by the county. And then I mentioned the Missouri Historical Society. And there's a link to look for what they've got. As an example, again, of where you would find one county's tax list, this is kind of extreme, but Cape Girardeau County, the Archive Center has 1828, 1831, 32, 1835, 1837, and thereafter with some gaps. The Missouri State Archives has 1803, 1814, 1815, and some others, as well as microfilm. State Historical Society of Missouri has 1814 and 1815. The Missouri Historical Society has 1817 to 1824, 1826 to 1838. And actually I think that goes up to 1840. Um, and then many of these have been transcribed, some because I've actually transcribed them but you don't need to go to those even now for many of these. And this is where you can go now. The uh, Missouri Digital Heritage, the State Archives is in the midst of a, an indexing project and digitization project for all those very old tax lists for Missouri that were in the Missouri Historical Society and some of which were in their own collection. So you get to it, and I've given you the link on the handout, uh, at the Missouri uh, Digital Heritage Census Records and Tax List. And the big red arrow means scroll down, and you will get to the search uh, block. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to search for the surname Clark in Cape Girardeau County. And... This is a work in progress. Not all counties for which there are available tax lists in that time period early have been indexed yet. If you wanna do something really valuable for genealogy, you might volunteer to help index those. Uh, Cape Girardeau County is done because I had already done some of them and shared that with the state archives and then also finished uh, indexing the ones that weren't. And uh, so I know it's done. So I pick somebody I can find in Cape Girardeau County. And I'm going to look 1810 to 1818. And I get this result, 
Well, I looked down the list and, and there's some territorial tax lists. And I found an interesting thing about this. There are some people double uh, assessed in territorial days. There's some individuals that were assessed in Cape Girardeau County and then also in Lawrence County, Missouri, which today is Lawrence County, Arkansas. But apparently the Wayne County area, there must have been some confusion about boundaries or something because the same people appear in both lists. And I'm assuming somebody sorted it out when they actually collected the tax. But it was just kind of interesting to me, which also goes to show if you if you got ancestors in Wayne County, you might want to look in that early period in Lawrence County, Arkansas, because there may be records there. Um, but I'm interested, as it turns out, in Francis Clark. He was a guy that came over in 1804 and got a he settled on land and thought he could get a land grant, and he actually applied uh, and to the land uh, commissioners. And it turns out he missed the deadline date by about four months. Yet somehow he still got a Spanish, well, he got a survey number eventually and got a confirmed grant. And I need to talk to some people about how to sort that mess out. Um, so here he is in 1818, and you'll get this that gives the basic information. But then you go down to the bottom, and there's a view images link. And if it's lit up with blue, or if it's there, you can click on that, and you can get to the original tax list. And there he is. And because he had a dwelling, which was uh, assessed at $100, and he paid $0.30 cents in tax in that year. Now, you'll notice something missing here. It's the column headings. Those were often only on the first page. So the way you would find those column headings, go back, search for a surname, begins with A, and it's gonna hit the first page. So you'll get the column headings. So that, if you've got ancestors early in Missouri, give that a try because it was used to be so much trouble to get to those original tax lists uh, early on in St. Louis and the Missouri Historical Society. And now these are coming out and are being indexed on the Missouri Digital Heritage. Thank you, Missouri Digital Heritage. Delinquent tax lists. Sometimes you can get value out of those. Uh, first of all, I would ask myself, okay, they're on the delinquent tax list, why? Were they insolvent? Had they moved? Were they traveling and missed the tax notice? Um, and then a lot of time, the, the first step after publishing the list, they were double taxed as a fine, usually. Then they threatened to sell the property. The sheriff would sell the property to pay the tax, which generated more records that you can look for. Even, and usually it was a couple years later, minimum, before they actually sold property to pay the tax. Even then, if they sold the property, depending on the law of the time, oftentimes the individual could redeem the land if they went ahead and paid the tax within a set period of time. Uh, again, you need to check all the records. Here's an example of a delinquent tax list. In this case, this delinquent tax list appeared in the deed book. I'm almost betting that if you had access to all the newspapers, there might be a version of this in a newspaper as well. But uh, here's a short delinquent tax list with, uh, and this, this was to the stage where they were about ready to sell it to pay the taxes. And I'm pretty sure this John P. Ettinger ended up, he moved to Perry County and just kind of abandoned the land. Uh, but I'm not positive because I don't know for sure it's the same guy. Here's what would have appeared in the paper. And this is valuable. Why is this valuable? Because this is Wayne County. 
every other record connected with this, except maybe some listings that might have been at the state level, burned. And so here you got people in townships, a few names. And if I were tracing back to any of these people, I would think, oh, well, I actually got a record from Wayne County. It's amazing. So what's the strategy for finding an ancestor's tax list? Well, search all the other records first so that you know what you've got to supplement the tax list. Census, probate, vital records, land, some of the earlier sessions in uh, the 12 part series of these presentations. Study the tax laws of the jurisdiction if you can find them. Most states, you can now find them online. It may take a bit of looking. Determine the county boundaries during the time of interest. Use maps to find water courses because oftentimes their land will be listed on this water course if they're an earlier list. Check for the availability of transcribed lists. This is why it's handy to have a genealogical library not that far away or access to one in some way, shape, or form you can check to see if somebody transcribed them. Locate the existing tax records, and you can find those in county and state archives, local archives, again, Percy, which is a compilation of articles. It's the indice or the contents for local genealogical society publications, and you may find a transcription listed there that you can then find that publication in a library. Examine the entire list, all the sections and names, because you never know what you're gonna find out of place. And then if you can't find them, check adjacent jurisdictions. Particularly on county lines, people might've been assessed in one county one year and the other county the next year. A few tips. Always check the first page for headings. If it was a lot of work, I guess, to repeat those column headings page by page. So it's going to be on the first page, and you better hope the first page survived. Pay attention to any special notations, like if they didn't pay or they paid early or whatever. Note individuals with the same surnames. These may be children, cousins, siblings, and so forth. Mesh the tax list with land, grants, patents, deeds, uh, land records and probate, and census records. Note if anyone might have been exempt. Well, why is this ancestor not in the list? And then you suddenly notice he was 60 years old. And you check the law and 55 was the upper limit. So, hey, he was not assessed. Delinquents may have died, moved, or been in another jurisdiction when the tax assessment was done. I'm going to work through a few examples where tax lists were used to clarify or answer questions. First of all, I ran across this guy in this tax list, and he, he, he was listed as Henry Boots. Who the heck is Henry Boots? Well, he was taxed on one 40-acre tract that was originally patented by Matthias Barkhart, and another one originally patented by Charles Sexton. And this was in 1845. Well, who was he anyway? There's, I focused on Charles Sexton because he's a pretty well-known guy, and I'm, I'm thinking Barkhart is not spelled correctly, but uh, Charles Sexton I could find in the deed indices. So I go to the deed indices and I check the direct index and find Charles Sexton. And I find this deed in uh, 1841 where he sold land. And lo and behold, he sold it to Henry Butts. Well, I think I answered my question. The guy's spelling was really B-U-T-Z and not boots. So that's who the guy was. This one's a little bit tougher. 
and it involved multiple different types of records, but the tax list helped too. Who is the mother of Perley Percival, who married a Skelton when she married, and she was born a, enslaved about 1850. The person that came to me asking about this had DNA matches with the white descendants of a Thomas Percival who lived in Missouri in Cape County, Scott County, and Stoddard County at various times, and then moved to Texas. He shows on the 1850 and 1860 census with a female who is pretty much right on the mark for Paralee's age. In 1842 tax list, he's one white pole, similar in 1843. He's missing from 1844. There is a Wesley Pierceful with one slave valued at $300 in 1845. Well, Paralee was born in 1850. So that's not her. Same in 1846, again, a slave worth $350. And then in 1850, one female slave, age 19. Well, that's not Paralee. So we go forward. Searching. Uh, probate records, Margaret Jane Percival was the daughter of John Dunn, and he gifted a female slave, Elizabeth, age 14, to his daughter in 1845. He confirmed that gift in his will, which was proved in December 1845. Tax lists then provide consistent additional documentation that Thomas W. Percival's slave Elizabeth was likely the mother of Paralee because the head Elizabeth, she was the right age to be the same slave on the tax list. Elizabeth was also listed, you know, this person that came to me said, well, I, uh, I must, um, it must be Thomas Percival because I shared DNA with you know, him, and he must be the father. And I said, well, you, you might want to reassess that. It's possible. But Elizabeth was listed as a mixed race enslaved woman, which does not rule out the possibility that that shared DNA of Paralee's descendants and Thomas Percival's descendants might be from John Dunn, his father-in-law, because his wife was would have shared DNA with him, as would any slaves fathered by him. So I don't know how that eventually came out, but there are ways you could test that. You could find other descendants of John Dunn through other children and, and see if they match. So the, the tax list helped clarify that one. This is actually my own ancestor, Zephaniah Thompson of Henry County, Tennessee, and I have no tombstone, no burial information, but I wanted to know when he died. I know he died by the time they moved to this to Missouri, but I found in Henry County, Tennessee, where they came from, he was listed on the 1836 tax list with land, 100 acres or 150, it's hard to read here, it's 100. The next year, 1837, Sarah Thompson, who happened to be his wife, is listed with the same 100 acres, with 100 acres. And so he died between 1836 and 1837. You don't need to be doing genealogy to use tax lists to answer questions. Someone came with to me who had renovated the Stephen Bird stone house from uh, sometime prior to 1830, and uh, they had wanted to know, well, when was it built? Can you answer that? So it turns out I could. In 1820, Stephen Bird had 714 confirmed and 340 unconfirmed acres, a dwelling house valued at $200. And then he had uh, enslaved people, taxes, were 968 and four mills. 
on this list didn't do personal property. It was not assessed that year. And then in 1821, he was assessed for 922 acres on Birds Creek, 140 acres on Apple Creek, one dwelling house and three improvements, valued at $5,108, which is an incredible jump. Ten enslaved people at $2,600, six horses, 18 cattle, valued at $500, and a mill, valued at $100. So his tax jumped up to $20.77. His property, real property, from two hundred dollars to fifty one hundred. I would submit that the house was built in eighteen twenty to twenty one. It's pretty obvious because of that big jump in the value of the property. Another situation where someone owned no land ever that I've been able to find uh, generally was pretty not very well off financially. This is my three greats grandfather's brother, David Edelman, married in 1821, 25th of January in Murray County, Tennessee. 1830 in Tipton County, Tennessee. In 1833, a David Edelman purchased one bedstead for $1.31 and a quarter cent at an estate sale in Perry County, Missouri. In 1834, he is on the Perry County, Missouri tax list with one poll, and that's it. Uh, subsequent Perry County tax lists are only for real estate, and he does not appear. In 1837, he's on the Cape Girardeau County tax list, again, only with one poll and the minimum tax for one poll, 37 and 4 eighths cents. And then in 1840, there is a widow, Martha Edelman, Patsy is a nickname for Martha, who's a widow. And then the kids actually match up with that 1830 census pretty well. In fact, that the age classes are exact. And uh, so I would submit that the guy on the tax list was the same guy. And he was moving up here along with other siblings of my three greats grandfather. Finally, uh, there's not a lot to go on when you look for help on using tax lists. There's some chapters and books. There are the wikis, uh, the links I've given you on the handout in Family Search and elsewhere. But this is probably the best existing uh, published guides you're going to find for using tax lists. So with that, I thank you very much, and I will entertain questions. So, uh, Bill, first question from Taylor asked about taxes from 1862 um, to early 1870s and asked, would those um, be only for the Union states? Um, gee, you know, I've never thought about that. Probably, but I would check on that. Um, I'm sure that would have not really... Uh, led to good feelings to tax the Confederates for a war that was prosecuted by the Union. But uh, certainly the Union states had it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, question from Sue um, asked about when, when a person passes away with no family members, but, you know, owned land or money resources, um, what, what, what became of that? And looks like um, she was looking in around 1887. Well, uh, I would probably think that they would make an effort to find other relatives that might uh, might be more distant. Um, if they had a will, I know there's one instance that I can think of where somebody did have relatives and ended up willing all their property to Perry County, Missouri, which ended up in a big lawsuit that was settled in the state Supreme Court, and they decided that the guy was not insane and that Perry County got the money. But uh, if there's no will and they had land and money, I think eventually, once they've exhausted all avenues, I think it reverts back to uh, the state, maybe, or I'm not a lawyer. The lawyer would know that. 
Uh, it might revert back to the feds if it had been federal property, but I'm, I suspect the states. Um, Bill, could you speak to uh, Mary's question? I uh, was curious when Oklahoma tax records would begin or uh, where she might go about finding that information. Um, you should go on family search and look at the wiki for Oklahoma and there should be a tax uh, segment of that that would that would uh, answer that question. And I think you touched on this a bit, but do you want to just revisit uh, resources across different states? It's all over the map. <laughs> and again, look at the wiki. And the one I showed for North Carolina, you're only going to find that for Lincoln County. And of course, where most of my ancestors lived in Lincoln County, they didn't. there are no tax lists. They're just certain districts. A little bit, yes. I've, I've got a little bit out of that. In fact, I helped transcribe those lists years ago, but uh, it's just all over the map. And for the most part, no, you just have to check. All right. Good to know. Well, Bill, thank you so much again. And thanks so much to everyone for joining us. Thanks, Maggie. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.